Hello and welcome to the Symmetry Sessions podcast. I'm your host, Heather McPaul. Join me for in-depth, down-to-earth, and casual conversations about all things healthy, wealthy, and wise. We delve into topics related to therapy, mental health, relationships, business, and more with guests from all walks of life. And even though I am a professionally licensed counselor, this is just a show. And the information presented is just for informational, educational purposes only. It's definitely not meant to replace getting professional help from a doctor or therapist. So please seek that help from a qualified healthcare professional if you need it. And if it is an emergency, please call 988 or other appropriate emergency services. I'm very excited to bring to you a variety of amazing guests and topics. So let's get started with today's episode. Welcome to the Symmetry Sessions. Joining me here today is Dr. Danielle Taylor, licensed psychologist, nationally certified school psychologist, chief operating off at Spectrum 360, and psychologist at Evolve Psychological Services. And she's here today to chat with me about how our frame of reference influences our work as therapists and the development of therapeutic models that we use. Hello. Hi, Heather. Thank you so much for having me on the podcast. Happy to be here. I appreciate you coming because you and I had a discussion not too long ago that kind of spurred this topic and um, I was like, well, we should, we should make that a thing. So, (laughs) but I was trying to remember how we got on that topic to begin with and I don't remember, do you? Yeah, I think that we were sharing a little bit about some of our own experiences with what I like to call inner spelunking, right? You know, our own... (laughs) inner work diving into those, you know, cavernous uh, depths and some of the things that we noticed uh, based on our own experiences that maybe weren't fully aligned with some of the notions that were put out there by people who are either teaching certain models, utilizing it. So that's what I recall. Yeah. And I, I guess, you know, I was trying to think about you know, some of the topics that we hinted on. And one of them was, um, well, I guess there was a few, but one of them was, um, I believe at Spectrum 360, it specializes in working with autistic um, uh, people with uh, neurodivergence. And I think that's one of the things that I had brought up when looking at some of these models, particularly um, internal family systems, um, because the way that we're taught the the model works is that, um, you know, uh, diagnoses in the DSM-5 are merely clusters of parts. And my uh, confusion there is, okay, but uh, neurodivergence isn't like, how can you look at that as a, I mean, here's the discussion, right? It's like, (laughs) I get how some things can be symptoms, those can be parts, but uh, I don't know how you can heal, heal, quote unquote, a brain that just works different, just different. Yeah, that's such an interesting thing to, to be curious about. And I, I think it, hints at the question of what is the nature of self with a capital S you know, what is the structure of, of that? What do we come with? Um, what's already built in, you know, when we're born? And, and I will say within the IFS model, you know, Dr. Schwartz doesn't provide us with any sort of um, a template or a model or anything there. And I actually recently completed my level one training and I asked that question on the last day. Yes, very annoying, right? Last day of training, everyone wants to get out of there. And here's Danielle with her hand up asking this deep philosophical question. But I asked a little bit about, you know, what what is the self? If there's a system that comes in, and again, this is a hypothetical, right? Experiences no kinds of trauma, um, has all of its needs met, has, you know, um, experiences that are aligned with with the self and also that are, you know, help them to navigate the culture we're in, et cetera. What's there, you know, what, what's the blueprint, so to speak. 
And in other parts models, there is a blueprint. So for example, um, IFS, you know, uh, IFS uses a lot of work from shamanic models and shamanic practitioners. And so shamanic practitioners would say the blue pit, the blueprint, excuse me, is your astrological chart. That's what you come born in with. That's the structure. So I say all this to say, you know, I wonder if part of self is the way that, you know, our brain functions or like our operating system. I don't even want to say the brain. I want to retract that. You know, is part of self that operating system that we come into the world with and, you know, with our modern understanding of neurodivergence and understanding that people have different operating systems and experience the world in myriad ways, you know, perhaps that is part of self. Perhaps those are not parts. Um, I think it's just key to really be open and flexible and curious and informed by people's lived experiences in addition to, you know, other sources of information. So that's my long winded thought <laughs> about that. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think it's, it's possible that just to teach therapists uh, the model, it has to be more organized than it really is mm -hmm. or that it could be. Um, because one of the things you and I had talked about is like in, in IFS, the, I, I'm the goal, right. Is that you unburden your parts and then you are more self-led and you are, uh, you know, I don't know your world. Mm -hmm. Um, but like you said, there really is no model for what that's supposed to look like. Um, and it's interesting because some, models, like you said, conflict, well, not conflict, but have different theories about that. Like IFS, uh, you know, parts maybe get different jobs, healthier jobs in the system. Um, in focusing therapy, they're integrated back into uh, that felt sense, that, that you know, essence, uh, they don't mm -hmm. call it self, maybe that presence. Um, what you know it's it's interesting because even dick will say uh, dick schwartz uh the founder of ifs will say you know he's even 40 years into this work and he still has parts that come flaring up and um so uh you know is there no nirvana at the end <laughs> yeah uh, i don't know it's interesting yeah yeah absolutely well i I sense and believe that, you know, we are spiritual beings having an embodied experience. And by the very nature of being embodied, we're going to have to deal with all kinds of stuff and things, right? So, yeah, I guess there is no, <laughs> because we're in the, we live in the systems that we live in, there are always um, going to be challenges and tribulations and just seems like that's the nature of of this experience and for me being and having been on this journey my goal is really to be able to navigate those things in a more skillful I'm going to use the word balance because that resonates for me um you know nuanced conscious way right mm -hmm. knowing that my parts for me, you know, I see my parts as being absolutely critical to my functioning. You know, I it's mentioned, mentioned like in focusing uh, therapy that it is more about integrating parts back into essence. I often have that experience where I do feel like my parts are integrating back into self, which I realize is a little different than the current IFS conceptualization. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's, it is about being able to come from a place where you are conscious, intentional, more of the time, um, knowing that there is nirvana in this experience right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I always uh, tell people that I work, you know, with in therapy that, you know, there is no end goal in anything that we're being mindful about. You're not going to wake up one day and go, holy shit, I'm done. You know, I'm complete. <laughs> I said, that I feel like the only exception to that is Eckhart Tolle, because if you listen to him, he doesn't sound like a human being. 
I'm convinced he's like some spiritual alien from somewhere, but obviously I've never met him. So I don't know. But, um, but yeah, but so one of the other things you and I had talked about was like that, you know, um, obtaining a lot of self energy doesn't necessarily like we do need parts to navigate the human existence, um, because it is complicated. Um, and because of our environments and how we grew up, we don't always, uh, have the skills or resources that we need to navigate certain things. And self Mm -hmm. isn't going to give you that just because you've, you now have it. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I feel that self knows, but self doesn't know how, right? So like, once you have more self, more access to self energy in your system, you will notice more that sense of, oh, this is a yes, or this is a no, or, oh, something doesn't feel right here or you know what this is in alignment with with me you'll have those senses but self doesn't tell you what back in the text message you know response to the person who has done something to violate your boundaries self doesn't tell you um whether you know how how exactly to respond when you're dating somebody new and you're like oh they seem enthusiastic instead of, you know, um, someone who's love bombing me, right? Like self doesn't like give you the play by play of the, those skills come from lived experiences that, you know, are, that our parts build that expertise. And so one of the things that I've noticed, like hearkening back to the, one of the topics for this discussion is that in some in some um, variations of IFS or, you know, IFS teachers or practitioners, you know, they will tell you, well, self just knows, right? Mm -hmm. And I really, as a complex um, developmental PTSD survivor myself, I really feel that that is rooted in privilege. So, you know, maybe if you have had some, you know, good models of relationships, you've had some experiences where you've been able to observe and be part of healthy interactions. You know, you've had mentors in different parts of your life, um, personal, professional, otherwise, that are able to really guide you and and show you how to how to function in the world, how to navigate. Um, Then yes, you might have that sense from self of, ooh, this is a yes, and then you know how to proceed, or ooh, this is a no, and then you know how to proceed boundaries, because even though you've experienced trauma in in other places, you also have those lived experiences of healthy boundaries, healthy interactions, healthy relationships. There are some people um, who have not had those models and who have not had any of those experiences because they've grown up in systems where they're actively being abused by caregivers and then the rest of the system knows and is complicit in the abuse Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and in those situations there are actually no safe relationships there are only relationships that are less dangerous Mm -hmm. and in in my lived experience and in my opinion that then puts you at greater risk for being in, you know, unbalanced, unhealthy relationships later because the best model that you've had, again, is a relationship that's less actively dangerous. So all that to say, yeah, and I'll, I'll, I'll speak, you know, from my own experience here, like, yeah, I'll feel self-presence kick in and, and be like, this, you know, this is a no. But if I hadn't done other work to skill up my parts on ways to set boundaries that are, you know, um, are, are healthy and not, because sometimes when you first learn to set boundaries, it's like, you might go a little too hard. Right? You, might, <laughs> you might really set that boundary hard, you know, but to set boundaries in a way that, um, you know, that feels good to you and uh, feels, again, healthy, um, balanced, again, whatever words resonate for you that are synonyms there. Um, you need to learn those skills. So when I hear IFS practitioners sometimes like putting the 
putting the kibosh on the, the ideas of resourcing or teaching skills or, you know, giving people opportunities to practice some of these things. I just think that's misguided and it's rooted in privilege that's created by the limitation of people's frames of reference from their own experiences. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think about, uh, uh, adults, uh, w with CPTSD and, and I think about like for myself, you know, I, I refer to myself often as a slower processor. Mm. Like I need time to sit and marinate and stuff. Um, and I think, you know, that I don't, I don't know that anything's going to speed that up for me. Mm -hmm. That's a bad thing. But to your point, I think giving the space to, to say, hey, I, you know, clearly I need a break to sit in something because parts of me don't know what to do and they're not sure what to say. And so I'm going to take this time to maybe um, explore that in therapy, um, sit in that myself and, you know, uh, but yeah, and I think about that in terms of like, well, what if we're not talking about childhood trauma? What if we're talking about neurodivergence? Like, mm -hmm. you're not all of a sudden going to make somebody's brain rewire differently mm -hmm. in that respect, just because um, they found self now. And I also think it's pretty important that we realize that like, unburdening parts, which is, you know, seen, I think, as the goal in IFS um, doesn't mean they don't like, I feel like a lot of times people are like, well, what does the part want to do now? And the part's like, I want to play because mm -hmm. I'm little. And, and then it's like, okay, but like <laughs> some parts have to stay right. and, and come to work with me. <laughs> you know, <laughs> My avoidant part has to put my shit away. My therapist part has to sit next to me and be strategic. You know, like we can't, get rid of them. They're not just supposed to be floating around, uh, playing somewhere in the back of our minds. <laughs> yeah. Just... Not everybody can retire, right? Like we've got to have somebody, you know, um, on board and, and online so that we can function in the world. I, I, I sense in my own system, yes, there are some parts that, that want to bring that playfulness and, and creativity and, and maybe they just need, they think they need to retire, but, or they sense they need to retire, but they maybe just need a little vacation. And you know, this is a question that I've asked and I've gotten different answers. So I've also just, um, based on my own professional and personal experience, I have my own theory, but I've, I've asked before, can parts grow up? Or are they always frozen in time at that at the age you know where they they were originally stuck, and in for me what I've seen with others I work with and with myself is that yes yeah, can grow up you know parts can mature they can you know learn how to use their talents in again more intentional conscious kinds of ways mm -hmm. uh, not be so polarized work together as a team um, so when I when I conceptualize or visualize my system, especially when I'm at work, I imagine calling parts off the bench. Like we're all part of a sports team. I'll be That's like, right. okay, I, you know, I have a bunch of stuff to get done under a very tight deadline. Like I really need you, 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 and you. Um, and if those were just, you know, five, six, seven-year-old parts that were, you know, kind of masquerading as adults, I don't think that they would be able to contribute in the way that they are now. We'd be fucking everything up. I mean, <laughs> I always give clients the visual of a child driving a bus. I mean, the, they can't even see over the steering wheel, right? They're all over the road. And so, yeah, you can't. Um, I think to your point, I think the answer is like, yes and no. Like, mm -hmm. yes, some parts that's. Yes. And some parts, I think we need to stay young in a, in a way to remind us of things like, you know, childhood whimsy and some of those more, um, I don't know, playful things, which I, I guess they say is a part of self, but that's not what self feels like to me. Mm, yeah, Self doesn't feel playful to me. It feels... I don't know, calm and sort of not serious. It's just above that. I don't even know. Yeah. Not playful. Playful feels like uh, something younger, but like meant to be that way. Yeah, I get that. And as we're talking, it's even occurring to me 
that the notion of a part staying young or growing up and it being somehow a dichotomy is a false dichotomy. Why can't it be all of the things all at the same time? Yeah. You know, it's a very westernized mindset to think of it as like either young or old. Um, yeah, you know, maybe maybe it can be shape shifting in there depending, you know, upon the situation. Yeah, I think obviously you wouldn't want your children trying to have adult relationships. That's not going to work. It's a good point. It's a really, <laughs> really, a really good right. and unsettling point there too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, and I, I like what you, I appreciate what you shared about your experience of self and it, it just reminds me why it's so important to stay open to what other people's experiences of their own system are like and to, you know, I think it's great that we have, we have frameworks mm -hmm. and to me, they're meant to be trellises for different people's flowers to climb up and bloom on and everyone's going to look a bit different. And honestly, maybe the, you know, the trellis is going to be different too. You know, um, it's not going to be the same for everybody. Mm -hmm. And I, I just, I think it's just really critical for people um, who, are, who are using this model to understand that and to, to really be open. And I think the better you know yourself and your mm -hmm. own system, the more open you're able to be to variations and just beautiful layered nuances in other people's system too. Yeah. And I want to say it's not an affront to Dick Schwartz because uh, no. I met him. He's a wonderful man to be around. Um, just a really good energy. But going back to something you said about privilege, um, I think it's worth noting that, you know, he's a, a white man who developed this and, and that might impact his ability to, um, to, to have th thought about or not thought about, but um, developed this in some way. It might have impacted the ability to develop because of that lack of resourcing, not thinking about um, underprivileged uh, people and the, the resources they've never had and, and the lack of mm -hmm. reference for um, those skills that Absolute, they might need. Absolutely. And I, I, I agree. And, you know, it's certainly not not calling him out, you know, by any, by any means, because the reality is due to all of our humanness, anything that we assemble is going to be biased. Yeah. Because we are, we all have our own frames of reference. We all have our own set of lived experiences. And I believe that the important things when you are a leader, right, of anything, and he is a leader, it's being open to other people's experience of what you've assembled. And it's really being able to listen to that and then being accountable for your mm -hmm. own short-sightedness that all of us have. We're yeah. all going to have it. And being humble. You know, you mm -hmm. have to have enough humility to be able to receive what people are sharing with you. In my experience, when a leader or a teacher or developer doesn't have those things or doesn't, doesn't openly express those things, some really scary things can happen. And, and it's, that's when we start yeah, treading in the, into the guru, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. We start treading into guru territory. And uh, yeah, I won't, uh, this is sort of a related, I won't share who or what, but I recently had an experience where um, I was part of a training experience and there was a major gap in the training model, a significant gap that was having an impact on um, some of the people facilitating the training, some of the people participating in the training. And when that was pointed out privately to the, to the teacher, um, although the teacher privately acknowledged that gap, the teacher did nothing to, to openly acknowledge that gap and to outline what steps they were going to take to mitigate the issue. Mm -hmm. And that's a major issue to me. Um, yeah. and, you know, and I, so I kind of live in the two worlds of um, educational and nonprofit leadership, and then also, you know, private practice as a clinician. And 
I am absolutely an imperfect leader. Let me be crystal clear um, and subject to all of the things I've outlined. However, when something is brought to me and I can, I can see that this is a significant gap, this is an oversight, this is a goof, you know, I own those things, not just one on one with that person, but openly to everybody who has been potentially impacted by that. Mm -hmm. um, I just think that that's really important. And the one thing I will circle, so bring this back to with regard to IFS and Dick Schwartz is it seems like it seems at times what, you know, Dick Schwartz is sharing as an individual practitioner, as a founder, is not always fully aligned with what's happening with IFSI. Um, and we don't have to get into that during this podcast, but I do just feel compelled to mention that. It seems that way because when I met him, when we had that week-long training, one of the things he said was he had gotten rid of all the P's, like oh, the P words. He doesn't teach people that anymore. Um, and there was something else somebody brought up and he didn't have the answer for it. And he said, I don't have the answer for that. We're still researching that. Yeah. And so to your point about being humble and addressing those things, um, yes. And also I think you're right that, um, you know, some of the, that stuff isn't coming down the pike. Yeah. And it, and I, I get that when you're scaling something up, it's really tough to ensure that that's happening. And I also think as a developer, an assembler, a creator, it's it's important to do whatever you can to ensure that it does to safeguard the of, of what you've put out there mm -hmm. and, to, and and really to to keep people safe. You know, it really is about the safety of those we serve. Yeah. And I think like there, you know, going back to what you were saying before, I think all of these models, um, whether you're a developer, a practitioner, or, you know, a client of it, we have to be flexible in the way that we see it. Because mm -hmm. to your point before, I've had experiences doing parts work where uh, it did not go according to what I was told it would be, mm -hmm. right? I found what I thought was a part and it was not a part. It was it was a piece of me, yeah. a piece of self, you know, which is um, something nobody talks about except for maybe like, you know, the people who are more uh, connected to or aware of like, uh, what do they call it? Soul. Uh, soul retrieval. Soul retrieval. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, I think it's important not to be too rigid about these things, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, I haven't done IFS level one yet because it, <laughs> no matter what I do, man, I can't get right. in. Right. Again, we could do a whole other podcast about IFSI, but if, which <laughs> listeners, by the way, is the, the Internal Family Systems Institute uh, yeah. that oversees IFS training and yeah, all the layers there with regard to accessibility in yeah five not, years five not years just, not just getting into the training but affordability and we yeah. could that's a whole other a whole other thing but yeah, yeah it's true for a whole other day yeah and you, you know what Part, but parts work has existed for way longer than ifs has existed i'm not going to even put a number on it because it will be the wrong number but of many many hundreds of years and its roots are really in you know shamanic traditions which is a very traditional form of spiritual healing that has been present around the world. Um, yeah. So it's parts work has been around. I mean, it's it's wonderful that Dick Schwartz, you know, believed his clients lived experiences, right? And he heard from them what was happening for them, and then he what he did essentially is he assembled things from other practitioners, from his clients' lived experiences. You know, there's Jungian stuff in there. Um, other of uh, other psychologists that that <laughs> their names are escaping me at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and and you know he put together a particular you know model with this. And one other layer here when we talk about things like creating models or you know privilege and those kinds of things, I, I it's it's also essential that first of all we live in a world where so many things have already been invented, thought of, like <laughs> manifested in some way that the likelihood that you are going to invent anything in our in our space is 
almost impossible. So Mm -hmm. can, can you experience different things through your training and your experiences with clients and then say, Hey, it seems like this really is aligned would align nicely with this. And like you assemble the parts and pieces in a different way to create something new. Absolutely. Um, and that's wonderful. You know, it, it, you can you can put things together, make things accessible that maybe weren't before. And I really think that's part of what Dick has accomplished with IFS. Um, and it's it's really really important to, by name, acknowledge those who came before that you're aware of that created, contributed to those different components that you've now reassembled. Um, Again, talking about like tiptoeing into guru territory. If you find yourself believing that you've invented something totally new, A, and B, you believe that it's going to solve all the things, you're in trouble. (laughs) Like you're, you're in a precarious place. So I just think that that's important too, to make sure that we're really giving credit to um, those who have contributed to the things that we are assembling now and giving credit by name whenever possible. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I do think there are so many um, therapeutic approaches that have similarities or they just use different terminology or, um, you know, things that maybe bite off the other. Absolutely. And, um, um, down the rabbit hole for a second, though, <laughs> about gurus. You do find in our community, like a lot of um, fangirling about yeah. some of these developers, these creators. Um, and But sometimes I don't think it has anything to do with what the, the, you know, the leader is doing in any case, as much as like how, uh, like, I feel like it's practitioners that form them into that guru kind of uh, status. I don't know. <laughs> And it's a little disturbing sometimes. Yeah, I, I agree. And I, I find it's often an intersection. So while a leader or a teacher might not be doing anything that seems to be openly inviting that, if they're not actively discouraging it, they're permissioning it. Mm. So if I, I, I find that yeah, anytime you notice the people that you're teaching or supporting starting to get dogmatic, starting to to really be become more more narrow, any sort of signs of of um rigidity. Teacher, yeah, teacher yeah. worship kind of stuff. So like yeah. for example, and this I mean this is nothing to do with Dick Schwartz. I've never been in a training with him, but I've been in other trainings where a person will ask a very respectful question right? So like, for example, they might ask a question about, um, are there any like related, are there any materials that are also like related to this model, but are not from this model that would help like deepen my understanding of some of the practices? Are there any maybe source materials um, from, like we were talking about before, some of those component part, you know, creators that- Did you ask this in level one? Did you do that? I I did not. No. (laughs) This is a different training. This is not about level one. <laughs> right. And so, and so, so I asked a question. I asked those questions because I was curious about deepening my understanding and talking about going down rabbit, rabbit holes. Like once I learn one thing, I'm always so interested to start learning the layers, you know, behind it and in front of it. And the teacher didn't even have the opportunity to respond. Other students in the class responded first and were saying, oh, no, 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 Danielle you don't need any other information. This teacher Mm. has provided you with everything you need. And I honestly, Heather, felt like I was in an alternate dimension for a moment. Mm -hmm. I I just thought to myself, really? (laughs) Like, how, how could anybody in any situation think that no matter how fantastic of a teacher you are, no matter how phenomenal you are, to think that you've provided everything person could need is really frightening to me Mm -hmm. and the teacher didn't disagree so that's that's an example to me of uh, again like you are passively permissioning teacher worship and so I can't speak at all to Dick I mean what he's created again like 
the scale of it is massive and and I I get it but I can't imagine him being like you know like I imagine one day when he has passed the research will keep going you know what I mean like I don't think he and he actually said that you know if it if he seems in any way humble it's because he's worked on that you know which is a, a refreshing thing to hear a teacher say but for sure um I can't imagine him I mean I feel like in some of his books it does say like I think there's like Buddhisty related stuff in there and all kinds of stuff so yeah I don't think that he particularly does that but I also think he's aware he doesn't know all the answers yes except that the model is taught in in a very structured way where it it, it I think implies that this is all you need Yes, and I, I and I sense that practitioners sometimes walk away from the be, from those experiences believing that, and I it I also sense that sometimes the trainers have parts that are afraid of not knowing the answer, mm-hmm. and so those parts will present as as all knowing. Oh, th- well, this is it. Th- like this is it. This is the answer. That's all there is. Because really, there's a there's another part that's like afraid to not know. So yeah. uh, part of the humility is that willingness to not know. And based on what I've, and you're, you're right, Heather, like in, in Dick's books, he does a much better job of really sourcing and citing where things came from. Um, and just in my experiences with trainings, that's less highlighted, right? Mm-hmm. So there's... Again, you know, and we're sort of now talking more about, you know, the the responsibilities of leadership, right? The responsibilities of being a leader and being and being a um, a prominent teacher. I I don't fault Dick for anything, and I would recommend, should Dick Schwartz be interested in my recommendation, that he he maybe take a look to ensure that there is continuity of his you know, philosophical principles as teacher, as leader throughout all of IFSI's materials, including training materials, including trainer training for the trainers. Um, mm-hmm. And that those things be codified like that. They, they be in the written materials too, not just in the written training materials, not just um, something that he like speaks in, in other places. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. And I think, and this, uh, I'm going to go a little bit further down this, this rabbit hole, you know, it's really challenging to shift from a clinician to a teacher to a leader to the founder of an organization and mm-hmm. and to be elevated mm-hmm. you know into a prominent teacher kind of role so talking about skilling parts up like who like who you need somebody to teach your parts how to do that right like if there's any if there there's any case to be made for um, parts needing resourcing, you know, for, and for me, part of resourcing is some sort of education there. There's mm-hmm. it right there. Yeah. Just, just because you're a fantastic clinician does not mean that your parts have the skills to be in leadership and to be, you know, the, the founder and face of something. It's a whole different set of skills. Yes, really. Uh, I, that, I feel that because becoming a group practice I say group. There's two of us, but anyway, a group. Don't short. It doesn't don't feel short. like a group. It's it feels like a pair. Um, <laughs> don't short tell yourself that's a group. Get a group practice. Um, I'm I'm getting hung up on the semantics of the word, but anyway, um, yeah, I've never been in charge of anybody except for myself. Mm-hmm. You know, so it, it's a very. I did not have the resources for that. I had to go buy books to better understand that because even in the military. I wasn't in charge of anybody. I mean, I was older than a lot of people in my rank, but like, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't in a leadership role. So Mm -hmm. I had no idea what, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that's definitely coming from a place of, of being on the bottom and, you know, only having to look after number one, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And sure you know, we can have some, right? Like self does have some leadership traits that are really important. And, you know, the, the, you know, curiosity and compassion and creativity, all of those are, you know, parts of being a a really good leader. However, like I said before, self knows, but self doesn't know how, 
So mm-hmm. your, your parts need experience, whether it be what, you know, what you, you did, like reading some books, getting training, having a mentor, mm-hmm. um, you know, so much of our skill building really used to come from community experiences. You know, it's become very different in our world. And, and that's why I find mentorship formal or informal to be a really powerful way to learn, yeah. um, to learn in connection like that. Uh, and it's just completely necessary. And I, I, I wonder sometimes if there are like accidental gurus and then there are intentional gurus, right? So like there are the gurus who go into it knowing they're trying to build a thing. They have a goal, you know, with regard to followers and what those followers will do and, and contribute to them, et cetera. And then but sometimes there are unintentional gurus, like maybe Dick Schwartz, like I don't believe based on what I've heard about his backstory that he, he created any of this or assembled it to become a guru. It, mm-hmm. It's like, and yet he has, right? So when you find yourself in that position, then how do you, how do you manage that responsibly? You know, how do right. you, who, but who mentors yeah. that? Yeah. <laughs> you know I don't know. I mean? It's like, right. Yeah. I mean, it's a good question. It's how do you, when you notice that there, there's a lot of quote unquote fangirling, how, how do you intervene with that in an appropriate kind of way to, to shut it down so you keep people safe, right? Because people can then misuse what you've created to, to unintentionally hurt other people, um, you know, and it's or very themselves. Slippery, or, right? themselves, or themselves, because right? I saw, and this, yeah. and I'm not going to get into too much, but there was a particular person who was not a clinician at the training and there was some inappropriate behavior towards him. Mm. And, um, I don't, you know, some of us noticed, uh, I, I, I feel like, I mean, I have no idea. I'm not inside Dick's brain, but like, uh, he took it in stride and did not really even flinch, you know? So, but it, it, going back to your point, like, I, I definitely believe the community mentorship thing can be so important. Um, but let's face it, in our community, there's a lot of people that reject that because, you know, who, how are you going to tell me, you know, there's a lot of egocentric, mm-hmm. egocentricness amongst therapists, I think, yeah. in general. Yeah, that's... That's something, it's something that you definitely find out there. And it's, it's interesting. It's like, I, I accept that it's not my right nor my responsibility to change anything about anyone else. Mm -hmm. And I do my best to represent myself in the world in a way that I hope that my team will, will follow, you know, like, like in my role as a nonprofit leader. So Mm -hmm. I make sure to highlight my mistakes (laughs) for everybody, Um, you know, be accountable for them. Um, You know, just, just a function from those, those eight C's and, and I, you know, hope that that will create enough safety and space that those parts that feel like they have to show up so strongly to prove, you know, who they are and to prove that they're not imposters and to, you know, to really, you know, show their competence in a, in a really um, intense way will, will feel enough safety to be able to soften back. So I don't know that that's an answer. No, but <laughs> a I large scale answer, but you yeah, know, but small it, it, scale. you know, uh, it's one of the reasons why I, I liked IFS so much is because it is uh, not just about teaching the client how to do these things. It's a practice you have to do yourself. But, you know, not being too rigid about it, you know, perhaps the <laughs> perhaps if you notice some egocentric parts, it's because you don't have the resourcing to do anything else. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And I know when I was early, like earlier on in my career, the imposter syndrome syndrome is fears, right? So 
and I mean, there are still times now that I, I will feel that that part that holds that, you know, showing up in different situations. And and so what's one of the strategies that that part might use? Well, I'm going to hoard as much information as I can, and then I'm going to, you know, wait until there's an opportunity to like, to show how much I know. And mm -hmm. I, I sometimes notice those kinds of parts coming across as very like egocentric, ego driven. I know best. This is the way, you know, this is the only way I'm right and you're wrong. I, I welcome all of us when we notice those kinds of narratives in our heads or those sensations in our body of that, like that maybe that tightening or, or clenching or the, just a sense of stuckness there when we're interacting with someone else to be, to, to wonder about what's really there and, and what's really present. You know, what, what would happen if the other person could just have their perspective? Right. Like, what would it, what would it be like, to just be open to them having the right to that and, and to not having it be a right or wrong situation. Um, mm -hmm. I often say in both, in both realms of personal and professional, we can validate people without agreeing with them. And that is a skill talking about <laughs> learning skills, right? Yeah. It's a skill that we, that's not emphasized in our culture. I can yeah. believe you. I can believe whatever you tell me your lived experience is, and I can still have my own lived experience. And I and and my belief in your truth doesn't in any way negate my truth. It doesn't take away from it. Mm -hmm. And that's a that's a product of like one of our cultural legacy burdens, right? Really of Oh my god, especially right now more than ever. Yeah. Yeah. Literally right now. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So that's, you know, um, the sense that that sense of scarcity that's rooted in capitalism because mm -hmm. it's the sense that there's not enough of anything to go around, including understanding or space for experiences. Yeah. So we're made to feel like internally we have to fight for that. Our parts are fighting for that. There's not enough love. There's not enough compassion, space, understanding. And then outside we are as well. So it's, I don't, I'm, I don't know that we always acknowledge that, you know, emotional, spiritual, psychological resources can also be impacted by that sort of capitalism, individualism, you know, all of the, the culture, um, yeah, yeah, all of those cultural isms that are, are burdens in our society. Um, yeah. Yeah. Can we talk more about like specific resources when like what specific resources in your um experience you, that people need oof that's a great question thanks <laughs> <laughs> I found that that people need sometimes specific languaging around how to respond to relationship situations yeah so you know, what should I say or write um, to set a boundary, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so actually a book that you recommended to me, I'll recommend on this podcast, if, if that's okay. Can I recommend yeah, yeah, yeah. books? Um, I'm like, what is it? I don't know. <laughs> the book, um, the book, Mothers Who Can't Love. Oh, I apologize. I don't one. remember the author. Offhand. I'll put it in the show notes. Yeah. So that book has sections that go through boundary setting. Mm -hmm. And it's specific language ab about these are things that you can say to set a boundary around, you know, access to you, whether it be, you know, time or the level of like emotional depth, you're willing to go with a relationship, you know, financial resources, etc. And honestly, when I got that book and read it, I was like, oh, ooh, goody. Like finally, like a tangible <laughs> thing that's like, here are some words you can use. So I've found that can be helpful. And like, once you sort of have that template, then you can sub in with your own, you know, synonyms, your own language, your own terms that feel right and aligned for you. Um, but it is really nice to have those examples, especially if you have a part that's an over explainer and a lot of people that have experienced trauma feel compelled to mm -hmm. over explain themselves because there's a part that believes if only 
I just can, hear me. Yeah. yeah. I can say this in the right way. If I can provide the right metaphor or I can, you know, just write it eloquently enough or succinctly enough, then they'll get it. Then they'll understand. Then they'll help me. Um, and that's a, that's a really rough, you know, burden to carry like many burdens are. And sometimes having, you know, some specific examples of language can be really helpful. That's really, uh, <laughs> I am connecting dots in my head right now because, um, you know, I have always thought of myself as a, I mean, I have a bachelor's in language, um, but I've always thought of myself as a lang like that's how I learn by giving me the language. Mm -hmm. And now I understand <laughs> why that is because even when I go to some of these trainings, I'm like, I don't want to experience it. Just tell me what to say because then I can do it. You know, then I can really embody and understand it. But I just need the language and then I can move on, you know? So yeah. now I get that that's all a part of that. That's really interesting. But yes, yeah. absolutely. Language, communication general. Yeah, definitely. Love, love, the, love the dot connecting. Those are always, always yeah, fun. Yeah. I'm like, oh, no wonder. <laughs> the other thing that, the other thing I've noticed is that um, it can be helpful to have some body-based strategies available to you. So whether that be breath work or some movement strategies, um, just something connected and rooted to the body. So another recommendation here, um, there's a website called Rewire Therapy, and it's a collection of different trainings that are um, clustered around different sorts of experiences. And they have um, a variety of practitioners that contribute to these trainings. So, um, you know, physicians, um, mm. Reiki practitioners, physical therapists, occupational therapists, psychologists, counselors, all different people who provide, um, people who are polyvagal informed, you know, who provide different physical strategies to help, you know, maybe express something, release something, feel something. Um, we live in our bodies. Our bodies, yeah. our bodies have experienced things that we cannot even call to mind. Our bodies have been here from the jump. So even before we ha you know, have conscious recollection, so that body-based stuff can really be incredibly helpful. So that's, I mentioned that because that's something that's at a very reasonable price point. It's accessible from home. You know, there are other kinds of body work that, that really benefit um, people at times, but those can be diff more difficult to access. Yeah, I would definitely um, want to put that in the show notes because I like the idea of having, um, a, a, renown is not the right word, um, reputable source instead of people going on TikTok, but you know, I don't have to get through my gripe about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. So yeah, so those are, you know, those are some examples. And then just outlets, you know, also for... <laughs> A lot of it, I know I already said this, but I just want to circle back to it. It's like, I think IFS, IFS and other systems do a really great job of supporting us in with healing individually. I think there's a lot less to support us with healing in community, which mm. I would suggest is an essential part of being a human being. Um, we are designed physically, you know, to, to be in community. Mm -hmm. And there is, there's so much um, healing that can happen when it is in safe connection. And mm -hmm. so resources and those resources will vary from person to person, but that support, you know, support people in finding safe community. Um, and in knowing that in that community, it's going to be people that are on their journey, like, like what we started with, right? We're never going to be fully, fully quote unquote healed. I know some people don't like, like the word healed. And I, I, I'm really, I respect that. Um, I just haven't found a better, a better term to use yet. Um, mm -hmm. But, you Actual, know, self-actualized. Right, right, yeah. <laughs> you know, none of us are, none of us are going to, going to get there. So we're all going to be imperfect. We're going to be imperfect in our connection. And that's not a reason to avoid community and connection. I would suggest that it's a reason to to seek it. And there are certain things that are just. And Dick does acknowledge this, like in his his um, writings. Like there's some stuff that you're just not going to be able to access um, 
even within your own system until you're in close relationship with someone else. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, some of those parts are just dormant un until somebody steps on the landmine, you know? Yeah. So, um, yeah, absolutely. And I've heard from, you know, from relationship therapists that, you know, talking to them from the individual, uh, therapist point of view, like I can't see those parts cause mm -hmm. they're not here with that person. Mm -hmm. So they don't come out. They only come out around that, which makes sense. Right. It totally um, does. And and, and I don't have an answer here. I want to be clear about that. But I am really curious about and really hope to be more of a part of creating more community healing opportunities. Like that's that's something that I would feel really honored to contribute to um, during the course of my lifetime and my career. What that, what that would be and what that would look like and all the minutia, I don't know. But um, it is it is a space. Um, where I, th I sense there is and have experienced there is a lot of need. And I know for myself, um, even though I have done incredible healing work on my own with a therapist, with a coach, some of the most healing experiences I've had, honestly, have been running with a really and just talking and processing while we, yeah. we go on really long runs. Mm -hmm. um, and I know other people who participate in things like endurance sports with um, friends have had similar experiences or other things like singing with a choir or, you mm -hmm. know, um, hiking with friends or just being in, you know, just all there's all sorts of, of different ways um, to connect and to heal together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think more than ever, we need to find some way to bring us together. And I think, you know, the, the, the usual way we have done that in our society is by enduring through a, a traumatic event, which, mm -hmm. you know, can't keep being the thing, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. we're already too traumatized. So yeah, it's so reactionary, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's not something that's accessible to most of us on an ongoing proactive basis. Um, yes, there are certain community groups that exist that some people are part of. And it's, it's wonderful if people find meaning and value in those spaces that that currently exist. And, you know, my, my hope is that there can be more of those, you know, those spaces um, with different, you know, different offerings so that everybody can find community and find a space that feels aligned with them. Yeah, let's just go back really quick um, about the whole resourcing thing, because obviously we're talking about um, more, um, you know, like IFS and some of those uh, similar uh, modalities. Uh, I would assume that some of the old school therapists would say, well, CBT, DBT, that's all resourcing. Um, but that's missing something else too. That's yeah. missing the, the inner work. So um, yeah, I, I think anyway. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I agree. I, you know, and for some people understanding the connections between thoughts, feelings, you know, behaviors that, you know, thoughts, feelings, actions, that could be a really helpful connect, you know, mm -hmm. And as in my opinion, as long as it's embedded in something that also, you know, looks looks at other things, you know, my um, my notice about like some of the original CBT models and things like that, it's like a lot of focus on control and elimination, um, and I in my opinion, those things, again, are, are rooted in a lot of cultural legacy burdens that we mm -hmm. have when it comes mm -hmm. to this notion that we can control, manage, handle, outthink everything. Compartmentalize, yeah. Right? And that's, you know, again... I'm that's how we got up, here. I'm going to bring up capitalism again, but, you yeah. know, it's like when I when I think about some of those approaches, if, if those strategies are used in isolation without, you know, things that also like focus on compassion, understanding, turning towards instead of turning away. Right. It, 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 the thing that pops in my mind is like that song whistle while you work, right? Like you don't, you don't deal with the underlying horrors of your working conditions. You just whistle. If you, mm -hmm. if you just, if you just whistle while you work in this hellscape, 
you know, everything would be fine. Like that focus on, you know, it's your attitude. It's nothing to do with the overall situation. Yeah. It's deeply problematic um, in, in so many ways that we can't, can't possibly dig into it now. But like, again, the idea, certain ideas that are there could be helpful to somebody um, if it's used as part of a strategy that's about turning towards instead of turning away and controlling, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, I I think I try to use a nice blend between like IFS um, and some other modalities like that and uh, heavy on psychoeducation. Mm -hmm. I know in IFS, they teach you, um, you don't need to explain it. You don't need to explain it to the client, just do it. Mm -hmm. And in my experience, that doesn't always work because of those lack of resources. They need to understand it and sometimes see it and sometimes look at the language or hear it um, in order to um, put it into action. Mm -hmm. Because that's how we're learning it as clinicians. Mm -hmm. Why would it be different for the client always, you know? Yeah, I think that's, yeah, really, really great point. And again, I think this is connected to really doing your best to be open as a clinician and having different things at your disposal so that you can meet your client where they are. You know, I almost, it almost reminds me of like motivational interviewing at times, you know, Mm -hmm. like when you're just sort of like being present with what is, maybe you're like rolling with resistance, you know, all those kinds of things. And, and sometimes you, you have clients, the times when I've found that I can offer IFS without explaining what IFS is, is if somebody comes in and they're like ambivalent and they'll say the words, well, this is my situation. And on one hand, I feel this way. And on another hand, I feel this way. I'm like, boom. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> we're like, go se- we're going to segue right in. It's like, well, no, for, you know, like the, this yeah. part feels, um, or but other clients, times, yeah. Not so much. Yeah. I, or like I've had clients who have already had some kind of inner work that they've done before, whether meditation or whatever. And so they just go into that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And it also depends on what populations you're working with. For sure. I, and again, th- this, this is connected back to right, like lived experiences. And, and again, I think there's some, <laughs> some individual perspective and privilege built in to to believe everyone comes in ready immediately for the kind of experience offered by IFS. Do I think everybody can have that experience? Do I think, do I believe that everyone has an experience with parts to some degree or another? Yes. But if we're going to meet our clients where we are, some clients are not in a space where they want to access that, Mm -hmm. you know, maybe that offering. And that's what it should be is an offering. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I often, this is just my own individual conceptualization, but I often think of IFS as like intermediate level therapy. You know, if, if you don't have the basics, when it comes to labeling your emotions, having Mm -hmm. even having a sense that your emotions are also visceral in your body um if maybe the only emotion maybe you you only actively think you experience like two emotions like i think i shared with this with you before heather like you know i noticed that the two sanctioned emotions in our society for adults are frustration and tiredness so a lot of (laughs) like a lot of people will be like oh that like those are the only things they notice yeah if if you've never had an experience where somebody's provided you with some sort of like social, emotional, um, you know, learning, you, you, again, like it's coming back to kind of like the, the privilege and under understanding that not everybody has had the same lived experience as you, as you, it maybe has not been, there haven't been opportunities or there wasn't enough safety to go to some of these places. Mm-hmm. You're going to have to start, start in a different space. And for some clients that absolutely is psychoeducation, um, or, and for other clients, it might be just a lot of listening and space holding to mm-hmm. begin with. Mm-hmm. Um, we can't, and that's where as therapists, right, we have to ask our therapist part to to soften back and let go of the agenda of whatever it has as far as what it wants to do in session, you yeah. know? Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. And I think, and not hold too tightly to protocols and mm -hmm. things like that. Yeah. One other resource I'd, I'd love to mention, and I am, this is not the right name of this training, <laughs> but I'll, I'll send you the link so you can okay. put it in the show notes. A while back, I took a training through PESI and mm -hmm. it was an exploration of how to integrate various models with IFS. Mm. So it included um, like Lane Peterson, who is, you know, like one of the, um, you know, one of the main trainers with DBT, some stuff with um, AEDP. It included um, just a, a variety of different uh, modalities. And it was really, really fascinating. Mm. I have found more often than not when you really look at the core elements of, of many, many different kinds of therapeutic models, there are a lot of similarities. There's a lot of, of overlap. And especially, mm -hmm. you know, I know I use, use those ter terms, but I kind of see these buckets where it's like turning away from or turning towards. If it's a model that's about turning towards experience, holding space for experience, honoring experience, um, you know, a as opposed to trying, to, you know, trying to control again, you know, control, eliminate, get rid of, you know, quote unquote symptoms. Th those are some, those are sometimes tougher models to integrate, but even there, there be, you know, there can be some overlap and, and some connection, um, mm -hmm. often more similarities than differences. Yeah. Thing else that we haven't touched on. I feel like we, that was good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we got to a lot of, you know, much more than our previous conversation about this. So um, I appreciate you coming and spending an hour to talk to me and, or, you know, to us <laughs> about <laughs> some of these things. And, you know, it, it, all of our episodes aren't usually geared towards therapists, but I think this is an important one. And I also think it's important for um, clients to understand that we're all using different models and that those models aren't necessarily always going to work for what their needs are. And so they should be more educated on, you know, what's acronyms that we all tout around. So. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for the invitation. It's really been a pleasure to, to be here. And yeah, it's just, um, I really am honored to have the opportunity to yeah, to be able to be part of the podcast and to put something out there that maybe resonates with people. And yeah, again, thank you and be well, everybody. Yeah, thank you. Take care. Thanks for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you're interested in connecting with Heather or the guest today, please see the show notes for that info. If you'd like to be a guest on the Symmetry Sessions, the link to send us your request is also in the show notes. If you enjoyed the show and you'd like to show some support, buy me a coffee at www.buymeacoffee.com slash symmetry sesh, S-Y-M-M-E-T-R-Y-S-E-S-H. You can make a small donation to help keep the episodes coming. And when you buy me a coffee, you're supporting small business professionals and podcasters. Every donation helps me to get better podcasting equipment and network to find new and interesting guests. Don't miss an episode. The Symmetry Sessions launches every first Friday of the month. So make sure you subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. Until next time.